Shanti, welcome to the temple this afternoon. Uh, we're starting a little bit early because uh, I have a, a date afterwards that I have to to meet promptly, and so I have to I had to speed up the schedule a little bit this this afternoon. I'm going to be talking about the four directions of life. And the key idea for this afternoon, at least that's in the back of my mind that I'm going to be trying to talk about, is this concept uh, of the number four. And four is a pattern. It's more than just a number. Numbers have meaning to them, important meaning to them, other than their mathematical significance. Uh, the mathematical significance is important. I'm not trying to diminish that, but there's also um, ideas and philosophies that evolve out of this concept of numerology. The mind that you have, the mind that I have, is oriented by its nature to a fourfold pattern. And for that sake, the mind of everybody, the scientists and uh, uh, the good guys, the bad guys, and otherwise, we have this, I, I call it an instinct, to put things into a fourfold pattern. You build a house, it has four sides to it. Or you make a room in a house, and it has four sides to it. That's normal. If there's a round room or a room with five sides to it, you walk in and it's odd. So th this pattern of four is an instinctive, natural pattern. We talk about the directions, north, south, east, and west. So there's four different directions. And you, know, you say, well, yeah, but it's divided into a lot more than four. You, know, you have eight because you have north, northeast, and south, southwest, and all of that. And that's true, but the basic pattern is north, southeast, and west. And it's fourfold. And I guess this afternoon what I'm suggesting is that it's just not an accident that it's happening that way. Uh, and I've been talking about this or building up to this uh, my two previous lectures, where I talked about a pattern of two. And in that I was dealing with or discussing the two fundamental realities. And those two realities are in Sanskrit called Prakriti and Purusha. And their realities, or we say they're real, because they don't change. Uh, spirit, Purusha, does not change. Prakriti, which is primordial matter, does not change. And when I talked two lectures ago, I had mentioned that these two realities are real. They're the truth because they don't exist in time. Anything that exists in time is transitory and therefore not real. It is these two realities that don't exist in time, and because they don't, they are real. And the word, the term that's used is immortal. Excuse me, eternal. Immortal means in time, so it's eternal. It exists out of time. Uh, I say prim primordial. To me, primordial means it's before time started. And so you have primordial spirit and primordial matter that we deal with. And it's two. That idea of two is reflected into the universe. And so everything in the universe that I'm aware of, that I think maybe you're aware of, is has this twofold pattern to it. 
And within the twofold pattern, what happens is uh, there's offspring. In other words, you have a mother and a father. And so that's the basic pattern, divine mother and divine father. And so you have a basic pattern of two. But mother and father have an offspring. Well, what's the offspring? It's the son and the daughter. And so you have two times two or a pair of twos, which is four. And we're back to this basic concept of four, or this idea of four. And interesting enough, the son and the daughter look a lot like the mother and father. There's a lot of relationship that exists there. In fact, when the son and the daughter grow up, they become the mother and the father. So there's a very intimate relationship that exists between the two let's say higher um, factor of two and this lower factor the offspring of the mother and father which gets you to four the thing is although they're all related all four factors are very intimately related to each other. They're each distinct in their own way. And that's what life is about. That's what how life is arranged. As you look through different religious philosophies, uh, through various mysticisms, and uh, throughout the ages, it comes down to us. One of the uh, things that comes into my mind really very uh, prominently is alchemy. And alchemy was very specific about saying there's, there's four elementals. Now they say there was a fifth. That's true. But the fifth was always strange, like we got a hand with four fingers and a thumb. You have the four and then the, the thumb is there but it's kind of an odd thing. I call it the God finger. And the four are what are really important in understanding this particular universe and trying to muddle our way through this particular universe. And so we're, you know, again, back to that fourfold pattern. And in alchemy, they, they talk about strange creatures that wander around the gnomes and the sylphs and the salamanders and they say those are dealing with the earth element the fire element the water element and the air element so there's four element there's four elementals that exist there and there's four elements that exist in life uh, again it's it's back to that fourfold pattern now the everyday man would listen to that and say, okay, well, that's kind of interesting, but what's that got to do with life? What's that got to do with my life? And the fact of the matter is, when the alchemists talk about these salamanders and gnomes and, or gnomes and uh, sylphs and that, they're not just saying it's elementals like fire. Where you look at a fire, oh, I stick my finger in and it, I get burned. They're saying it's a living thing. They're saying it's real. They're, it's it's not that flame is not just the flame. It's alive. It has a life to it. They're saying the lake isn't just a lake. It's alive. The air isn't the air, it's alive. And I think it's fascinating. I have an electrical background. And in college, I studied electricity. And you deal with, you have to deal with wiring and wires uh, that you connect to things. And one of the expressions that was used was, you know, if there's a wire laying there, be be careful, that's a live wire. Now, isn't that interesting? 
they'll deny that the flame isn't alive, but then they say there's a wire there, that, there that's alive. It's an, an interesting faux pas, <laughs> if I could say it that way. But the idea is the same, and it's important to understand. They call it a live wire because it has a life of its own. If you're not real careful, you could get electrocuted because you don't know and understand the laws of electronics or electricity. In the same way, these elementals are alive, according to that alchemical which I'm talking about. But I'm strongly suggesting that if it's true there, and we move over into just a different philosophy, Hinduism, uh, I would say you know, Kabbalism, or any mystical teaching that you go into, they're really saying the same thing. They're all saying the same thing, that there's four mon fundamental forces which exist in our life, and those four fundamental forces that exist in our life affect us. They have an impact on us. And just like grabbing the, the wire, if we're not careful, the live wire, if we're not careful with these forces, these four forces, we're going to get burned, drowned, <laughs> uh, suffocated, or, or defeated intellectually. And you say, well, that, so you're saying that the earth, you know, the ground, you know, I have a handful of dirt and it's alive. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but I, if I understand the philosophies that deal with it, they're saying, yeah, it is. In fact, this idea and this concept is really deeply ingrained in our society whether you know it or not and if you say well you know what do you what do you mean ingrained in our society that the the air element is is alive well did you ever hear of fairies i, th I think in florida and california there's a there's a whole multi-billion dollar industry that started with the concept of fairies. If, if, if fairies are such a meaningless dead thing, then what's Disneyland doing there? Talking about the fairies. And children believe they're real, and the parents maybe argue with them or don't. We grow up, you know, we, when we're children, we believe it, but when we grow up, we lose that belief and that faith. Maybe the children are smart and the people grow up dumb. Maybe they know something we don't know. And what about the ocean? The ocean is doesn't have these elements. Oh, sure it does. You ever hear of mermaids? Mermen, mermaids? These are strong ideas and concepts and forces that are ingrained in our society the concept of mermaids. A mermaid is a sylph. It's, it's one of the forces that exist in the water element. The fairies are the forces that exist in the air element. We're approaching St. Patrick's Day in honor of our Irish friends. Don't they talk about little green men running around in the forest? The, air, the earth elements. These are earth elements. And all of these things that I'm talking about and that I mentioned are portrayed with human characteristics. The fairies are human. You know, they're, the, the mermaids are human. little 
green munchkin men. They're humans. Now, they're, when they say that, it's not that they're humans, humanoid, but they have that form, and it's done that way so you can associate with them, so that you can understand that they have an impact on you. And you know what the impact is? And, and don't lose this thought. It's important. It's not that they run up to you and punch you in the nose or drown you when you're swimming or anything like that. That's not the force field that's affecting you. What it is is they have a consciousness that exists behind them. That's what we mean by alive. There's a consciousness that exists there, and it affects us. The ocean has a consciousness. You don't think so? You know, walk... Go to the drive to the coast, get out of the car, and your mind is, has a certain frame of mind. And then walk towards the ocean, and you know, assuming that you don't see the ocean at first, then you you move around a corner or about, and you see the ocean. Or even when you're driving, and you see the ocean for the first time along the road, I've had the experience. I don't know whether you have or not, but you say. It impacts me, and, and they'll say, oh, it's just the, the scenery, and the scenery, and I'm suggesting it's more than that. There's a consciousness that's there, and it affects you. It affects you, what you can see. I've been talking about visual types of things, but the same is true about the sound. You get near the ocean, and the sound of the ocean, as the waves come in to the beach or if there's a rock there, they crash against it. And you, and you can get memorized by it, mesmerized by it. It affects you. And what I'm saying or suggesting, it's the consciousness of those elements have an effect on you. You can go out and start a fire, and you get, you get mesmerized watching the flames and, and the fire. You could sit there for hours, some people just watching the flames, the mesmerized by it. And we say mystically that it, it's alive. And so we have these elementals, the four elements, and these four elements do affect us. They impact us on a deep level. That deep level is the level of consciousness. And I always say that um, we deal with astrology here at the temple. Astrology is extremely important. And if you ask a scientist, you know, the, if you ask the scientists about astrology, they'll say, no, astrology doesn't work. It can't. And their rationale for saying that it can't work is because Pluto is so far away, there's nothing on Pluto, or as far as the planet Pluto is confirmed, and they decided to degrade it into, I think, a planetoid or something. It's not. It's a planet, astrologically speaking. But... Um, they say it's so far away, the electrical force is non-existent. The atomic force is non-existent as far as you and I are concerned. The, uh, the force of gravi gravitation is non-existent. Therefore, Pluto has no effect on you. The, the candle here, <laughs> this candle holder, they would say, has more effect on you than Pluto does. <laughs> So we should have, uh, I guess, an astrology for candlesticks, I guess. <laughs> That's what they're saying. <laughs> and uh, the mystic says, no, that's you know, not it. The planetoid. Pluto has a consciousness, and the consciousness of Pluto is very powerful. Not because in and of itself it's powerful, but because my subconscious mind, my unconscious mind, 
is aware of the, that consciousness of Pluto. And those two are what are interacting. And those two things are independent of time and space. Consciousness is not limited by time and space. As I've said a number of times, many times in other previous lectures, you go to the end of this universe and they'll say it takes 8 billion years to, at the speed of light to get from one end to the other. Or is it 16 billion years now? I don't know. Whatever the size of the universe is. So they take billions and billions of years for... Well, physically that's true. And, and as far as the physics that we're aware of today, that's true. It takes billions of years for light to travel that far. But consciousness is not limited by time and space. And so the consciousness, or the effect of the consciousness, is instantaneous. There is no time factor there. Now, that's hard, and I've talked about this before, it's hard to, for us to deal with that as humans because we can't conceive of what it means to not be in a state of time. We're time creatures, and our mind is a time mechanism. And so to say time doesn't exist, or there is some universe where time doesn't exist, it just doesn't compute. For most of us, our head can't conceive of that or think of that. There's always, well, where was the beginning at? Well, there's, there's a beginning in time. But there was no beginning of prakriti, of primordial matter. There was no beginning of spirit because there was no time, there's no time relationship that exists there. So it's really meaningless to talk about beginning and end and time when you deal with those, those things. And those are the things that the universe is really made of, or that's where the universe came from, is from those particular points. Now, I had just mentioned that you know, they want what's the beginning. Well, if there's a beginning, there's a middle. And if there's a middle and there's a beginning, philosophically, absolutely, there has to be an end. If there's a beginning, there must be an end. And of course, if there's a beginning and an end, that by sheer implication, if nothing else, means there's a middle there. And that's where we get the three. And I tried to talk with that last time we talked. I tried to say, well, here's this, that idea of three comes into the picture. The idea of three coming into the picture is the idea of Prakriti. And Prakriti has three gunas. And the three gunas really are the beginning, the middle, and the end. And you can, any threefold categorization can be done with that. So you have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and there's the threefold factor. And that's what happens with the f elemental forces that I've been talking about. If you want to understand these forces, by the way, let me just say this. The best way to understand what are the fundamental forces in life, the elemental forces, who and what are they are, how do they affect us, how, do, how are we manipulated by those forces, you just pick up an astrology book. In astrology, every sign has one element associated with it. So the fire sign, there's 12 signs, and there's four elements. So that means, uh, for example, Leo, uh, Sagittarius, and Aries. Those are all air. <laughs> Excuse me, those are all fire signs. So they're affected by the fire element. And then you say, okay, well, what makes them different? Well, what makes them different is the 
the beginning, the middle, and an end. So for each sign, each sign has a beginning of it, a middle of it, and an end of it. Or if I could say it slightly different, each quadrant has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And forgive me for a moment, I'm kind of stumbling over the words, but what I'm suggesting is each of the, the f- f- um, elementals is modified by the three, the trinity, the threefold factors of beginning, middle, and end. And so you take the three and you multiply it by four and you get 12, and that's how you get 12 zodiacal signs. It's a mix of an elemental and a beginning, the elemental and the middle, and the elemental and an end. And you get 12 different patterns there. And again, if you want a description of which, what each of these patterns is, you just pick up an astrology book, and an astrology book very clearly delineates what all the, the factors are. And as you read that, understand what they're saying is that the configuration of the universe, the universe that's out there is affecting us. It affects us based on our horoscope that we have. And if you want to understand what that effect is, uh, the the astrology books tell you what the, the effect is. And so you say, well, then that means we're predetermination. It's our life is predetermined. And the answer is really yes and no. Yes, it's predetermined because those elemental forces are very powerful forces and they're affecting us and we're acting like a puppet and doing what the elementals say we should be doing and what the Trinity is saying that we're supposed to be doing, each of the zodiacal signs. It's telling us what we're supposed to be doing. And we're doing it. Our subconscious mind says, yes, you're going to do that. Uh, you know, Saturn's in your sun sign, uh, that means you're going to be depressed. And we say, yes, sir, and we get depressed. But it's by choice. We choose to get depressed. It's not that we're forced to do it. So it's not predetermination, predestination. Whatever your chart is, the chart can be overridden. Now, it's not easy. (laughs) Much easier said than done. Because the forces are very powerful. But there's one force that exists that's far, far, far more powerful than your chart. It's far more powerful than any force that exists in the universe. And that's the force of your consciousness. So what I'm saying is, if you're having a bad time, you're having a bad time because you want to have a bad time. If you're having a good time, it's because you want to be having a good time. Like I said, let me... uh, That's what our thought is. That's what we're thinking. But what I'm saying or suggesting is it's not true. Inside of us, our consciousness is saying, okay. You're, the, the, the force field outside of us says to me, I'm supposed to be depressed. Or it says I'm supposed to be happy. And I'm saying, okay. And then I get real depressed. Or I get real happy. Wow, I won the lottery. That's why I'm happy. That's not why you're happy. There's people that win the lottery and commit suicide. How can that be? There's people that lose an arm and a leg and they're happy. You know, they're inspirational speakers talking about how great life is. You say, how can that be? That doesn't make sense. Well, it doesn't make sense logically, maybe, or philosophically logically, 
But if you understand consciousness and the way consciousness works, it makes perfect sense. The person just says, I'm not going to be limited by those outside forces. I'm not going to let the moon my day. <laughs> I'm not going to make them get them to make me win the lottery. I don't want to win the lottery because I don't want to be forced to do anything I don't want to be doing. I want to control my own life. I want to be controlling my own destiny. And you know what? If I win the lottery, I'm going to be sucked into this earth world and all the mechanisms and manipulations of people trying to get the money from me. And I don't want to have anything to do with that. So I'm not interested in the lottery. I'm just interested in life and getting through this life and being happy with what I got. And from that point, from that position, wherever I'm at at that point, I want to advance spiritually because that's really where the gold is at. That's really the, the best lottery to win is balanced self-conscious awareness. So I wonder if any God is having a lottery ticket for that. If, it is, if there is, put, you know, <laughs> let me know because I want to get in on it. <laughs> I'll pay for that one. <laughs> uh, now, uh, I had mentioned that in the beginning, this, this uh, primordial matter, primordial spirit, something ha primordial matter has no consciousness to it. It's a thing. Um, spirit has consciousness, but it doesn't have anything else. And according to Shankya Yoga philosophy, consciousness wanted to do something with primordial matter. As I understand, I don't think it was an accident, or as I understand the philosophy, it wasn't an accident. It was with intent. And so consciousness interacted with primordial matter. Now, that's on a philosophical point. We anthropomorphize it by making it into things that we're accustomed to. And so what we do is we say, oh, the spirit is like the male principle. And the matter is like the female principle. And so you have you know, the man and the woman, they get together. Or the male and the female, they get together. Prakriti and Pushra get together. They got married. And they had a baby, and the baby was called our universe. And out of our universe, or out of this, this uh, joining together or working together of these two principles... The universe evolved, was projected out, however you want to say it, and just like the universe out there was projected out, the same is true of the universe within us. And so within us, we have this divine mother and divine father um, principles within us. We're a part of this universe, not a part of us. You know, we're a part of the universe. Everything is one. You know, that's where the one comes in. Everything is really one. Now, Though that's true, of the, it's true of the external universe, it's also true of us. And so what I'm saying or suggesting is that within us, there's a divine mother and a divine father. It's called the Ajna Chandra Chakra in Shakya Yoga philosophy. And it's at the top of the spinal column. And we say here, between the eyes at the root of the nose, at the nose is the sun. And just opposite, 
opposite that at the Mandula Oblongata is the moon. And those two at one time were one chakra, is what they say. And this is actually, this, in Western tradition, it's the story of Adam and Eve. Adam went into a trance, a meditative state, and separated the ma male side from the female side. Now, within the two entities, or within the two, exist really complete entities. In other words, though the masculine and the feminine were separated, the masculine contains the feminine, and the feminine contains the masculine. However, there's inclinations in each one that are stronger, if I could really maybe, <laughs> maybe saying it in a, hopefully not too bastardized a way of saying it, because it's really a, it's a high, high event, a very mystical event. But when that happened, of course, they had offspring. Uh, there were generations that eventually, I'm making, I'm making a short story, very short and sweet and fast and all that, running out of time. <laughs> had offspring. These offspring were called Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. And um, that's the diagram that I gave to you is what that's all about. Uh, I put that on there because I started talking about the fourfold pattern of life. And I said there's four distinct elementals. But then I said, well, wait a minute. Now there's this beginning, middle, and end. And so the, the qualities are changing, and there's three of those, and now all of a sudden I'm at 12. They would say, well, yeah, that's 12, but six of them are male and six of them are female. And from that we get... Uh, the six planetary systems. And again, I apologize. I'm going through this really fast um, because it's, it's kind of uh, separate from the concept that I'm, or the idea that I'm trying to talk about today. But what happens is those um, pieces of the universe, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, those pieces of the universe exist within us, or at least the consciousness of those pieces of the universe exists within all of us. Again, we're part of the universe. And that's what's represented here and I'm trying to show here. And the key point I was going to get at was, at the top what we have is two. Two, which is the male-female. That separated out there was a projection out in the universe and a lot of stuff happened. Creation of the solar system, projection of the solar system. And it ended up at what we call Saturn, at the base of the spine. And at the base of the spine, there's four aspects to the Saturn chakra. It, it, what we say uh, in, in yoga is it has four petals. That means it has four characteristics. Well, I'm back to the beginning, and uh, I have to conclude at this point. But what I'm saying is there is an intimate relationship between the sun-moon center, the Ajna Chandra chakra, and the Saturn chakra, which is four petals on it, or four force fields. And those four force fields are related to the four fundamental forces that exist that I had talked about before. And um, again, this the last few minutes, I know I've just thrown a whole bunch of stuff out there, and I apologize for that. But I want to let me close off at that point and just see if there's any questions. And I'll have to pick it up at a future date uh, to go into that a little bit further. Yes, it's the same thing. Wherever you see this intimate threefold pattern, they're talking about an extension of, usually, I should say, 
they're talking about an extension of the Brahma Shiva Vishnu idea. And they'll talk about light, darkness, and heat is another way that it's talked about. Thank you for your uh, participation this afternoon. Shanti.